Hello, and welcome back to Compressible Flow. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today we'll be talking about two major subjects, which involve shock waves, but also more applications. We'll look at air blast similarity theory, which is a very famous theory, which of course explains the collapse of air blast solutions. Then we'll look at the convergent divergent, that is the Duval nozzles, and normal shocks inside them. In the isentropic part of the class, I have shown particular nozzles with shocks, and now we have the tools to return to the problem and analyze them. Let's begin. I like to start with a quote sometimes. This one is, of course, by Dr. Robert Oppenheimer of the Manhattan Project in the United States. It's a fascinating history of the project, which, of course, changed the global dynamics of warfare. He wrote, We knew the world would not be the same after the blast, of course, in nuclear weapons development. He wrote, a few people laughed, a few people cried, and most people were silent. I remember the line from the Hindu scripture, he, which was, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty, and to impress him, takes on his multi-armed form and says, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Certainly, Dr. Oppenheimer and many of the scientists, engineers, and mathematicians involved in the Manhattan Project were well aware of the destructive force that they created. And they were, of course, morally concerned. I think none other than Dr. Oppenheimer was particularly perturbed, to say the least, of his creation leading the scientific effort of the Manhattan Project. Today, we'll look at the implication of these types of weapons with blast wave similarity theory and look at particular history with respect to this. This is one particular picture at the Bikini Atoll of a U.S. nuclear weapons experiment. You'll see that indeed there is a mushroom type cloud forming and there's some sort of discoloration in the photo between the black and large white parts. Here along the ground a lot of dirt's kicked up and there's a turbulent flow induced by the velocity in the direction of the blast wave. So here we'll try and apply the concepts of moving shock waves to analyze the energy and estimate the energy of nuclear weapons only from pictures. And this is what, of course, the Soviet Union and those in the United Kingdom did to analyze and estimate our nuclear yields, which are, of course, classified information. Here's the three main people involved in the blast wave theory. And I'll write my read my caption for you. It says, the theory of a moving shock wave and the flow field pr produced by an intense spherical explosion in air, the air blast problem, was formulated by three famous mathematicians. The first was John von Neumann, who's pictured in the upper left. He's probably one of the smartest United States citizens who's ever lived. The second was Ger Sir Geoffrey Taylor, who's in the lower left. He's a famous food dynamicist. And the third was, of course, the Soviet Leonid Setov. They all were living in the mid 20th centuries and have all now passed on. Nonetheless, they all were able to analyze the bomb intensity from shockwave and blastwave similarity theory, which we'll learn, and it's very simple as you'll see. Dr. John von Neumann, the upper left, of course, was involved in the Manhattan Project. So his development as a theory was really confirmed by his own work. Now the air blast problem will examine the flow field produced by an intense spherical explosion. And you can read a lot of details about this very interesting fluid dynamic phenomena in Thompson Compressible Fluid Dynamics in Chapter 8. Now let's try and analyze the particular blast wave theory through simplification of the problem. And we'll make these simple assumptions and you'll see that they still produce rather accurate results even though they break down. We'll first assume that there's a perfect gas atmosphere which is initially at rest, which that rest condition makes sense unless there's some strong wind. And of course we're not accounting for like real gas effects. The second major assumption is that we'll have spherically symmetric explosion, that the explosion direction is really isotropic, that as the explosion in blast wave spreads away from the source of the fusion or fission, then of course it'll be spherically symmetric about that point in space. We'll also assume that we have very, very, very strong shock waves, which is to expect at any time you have an explosion. And that might have a static pressures 
and static temperatures will be much greater than P1 and T1 respectively. And here P1 and T1 are roughly the atmospheric pressure and temperature respectively. We'll also assume that a very, very large quantity of energy is released at a particular point in space at time T0. So how do we release such energies? Well, of course, there's nuclear weapons, but there's also conventional explosives that, of course, rely on chemistry. There's EGDN, PETN, TNT, RDX, ANFO. These are all just typical ones, and they're beyond the scope of the class, and we're not really interested in these things anyway. They all have a lot of industrial uses too, for example, in mining and, of course, opening up roadways through uh, tunnels and, and uh, valleys. So they're wonderful inventions that, of course, change society. And they can be used for good or perhaps uh, less good purposes. One might ask, what do all these have in common, including what they have in common with, of course, nuclear weapons? Under our particular stated assumptions, we might be reasonable to assume that we can neglect P1 and T1 of the undisturbed atmosphere because, indeed, the static pressure and temperature after the blast wave passes a particular observer near the explosion will be much, much larger. But we can never neglect density because, of course, we could not have a vacuum in particular in front of our waves. So rho 2 over rho 1 will actually approach values near 6, as we showed in our previous asymptotic analysis in this class, as the Mach wave of the shock, the blast wave Mach number, becomes very, very large. Remember, we analyzed and found that as the Mach number goes to infinity, the ratio is the density across the wave, standing or moving, should approach a value of 6. And so that doesn't asymptotically increase like the pressure and temperature. Let's now return to dimensional analysis. And in your aerodynamics or fluid mechanics classes before this one, you should have learned the famous Buckingham Pi Theory. If you haven't learned Buckingham Pi Theory yet, now is a great time to return to it and review. In Buckingham Pi Theory, we are able to identify a number of dependent and independent variables and uniquely identify the number, the minimum number, and non-dimensional terms if there's similarity within the particular problem to characterize it. It's of course named after Buckingham and we won't review his history today. Now let's identify the independent variables in the blast wave problem and you can really analyze any type of problem this way. For example, if you could try and categorize art and art history in this fashion, that would be interesting. Nonetheless, we know that rho 1 is an important value. We'll call that rho sub infinity because it's the ambient pressure. We also know that the energy released by, of course, the reaction, the temperature T, that is, excuse me, the time T, little t, is dependent on the blast wave position as a function of time, and R is the distance from the origination of the blast center. So these indeed are the independent variables that define the problem for strong shocks. What values do we want to solve for? The dependent variables that are unique. We wouldn't want to have two and have them be redundant in some way. They would be the velocity, the pressure, the density, and the temperature, which is nothing but P over rho R, according to our assumption. So really T is redundant in some sense, temperature. So you can see through the dimensions, we have our independent variables will be density, E, T, R, will be respectively mass times the length cubed, mass length squared over time squared, time and length, respectively. So there is indeed apparently only one non-dimensional parameter through the combinations of these variables. And you can prove that through Buckingham pi theory. The number of pi factors here is unity. And so we can write this equation, 452. Eta, the left-hand side, will be our non-dimensional parameter. It's my choice. I call it eta. And the numerator will have r. That's the distance, the current distance that the blast wave is at from the center of the reaction. And the denominator will have the energy of the reaction divided by the ambient density to the fifth power times time to the two fifth. And so all blast waves, that spherical waves of high energy coming from some local source, will fall along this dimensional combination according to the non-dimensional factor eta. Let's see what that means. But before, we'll write some major notes. First, eta is our similarity variable for the air blast problem. 
For example, an atomic bomb and a stick of dynamite will produce similar flow fields, that is the flow around the whole device will be very much alike and have similarity and scaling if they have the same values of ADOF. So it doesn't matter if it's a nuclear explosion or a little firecracker on the 4th of July. Eta, if they are the same, will have the same flow fields. Now we'll let R be the radius of the blast wave, which is the moving shock wave distance. Then we can put in capital R for eta, and that will describe the similarity solution for the blast wave itself in one particular value R. Capital R is the current position. We can then find the velocity of the particular wave by taking the derivative with respect to r in time. So the velocity of the wave v sub s will go as dr dt. Using our similarity formula, 452, we can derive two-fifths r over t. Check the dimensions. r has dimensions of say meters per second, excuse me, meters, and t has dimensions of time. Therefore the dimensions are meters per second. I guess I was getting ahead of myself there. Hmm. Nonetheless, the shock wave Mach number, m sub s, will go as v sub s over c, right? So we define the shock wave Mach number, just like we did for moving shocks, as the velocity of the shock divided by the speed of sound in front of the shock. The speed of sound in front of the shock is, is basically a constant, because of course that's dependent on the temperature of just the atmosphere, which is not changing at all until the blast wave gets there. So if a shock wave, say, moves at a constant speed, dr over dt will be constant, then we can estimate using our formula we derived in the fifth bullet point on the page as 0.4 r over t, which is, of course, two fifths. The shock wave moves slowly as it moves farther and farther away from increasing radius r, and it eventually decays in an acoustic wave. So eventually, and initially, the shock wave is very, very strong. As it spreads out spherically through the atmosphere, it'll eventually decay into an infinitesimal acoustic wave, and of course the viscous forces and the humidity in the atmosphere will just completely dissipate it away. This must indeed be true, as it would require an infinite amount of energy to drive the shock through the atmosphere at a constant speed forever, especially if it was, of course, spherical. It's not a plane wave, which could travel forever if there were no losses. Let's look at a particular XT diagram to illustrate this effect, and this is from the Penn State Gas Dynamics Lab. On the x-axis is time t in milliseconds, and the y-axis is radius. So we have this XT diagram for r and t in our equations, like 452. So initially, at time zero, nothing happens, but then there's a small burst of energy from the chemical. We can track the path of the primary shock. So out here is the ambient medium, and the shock wave is traveling from low radius to high radius with increasing time. And you see that streaked out by this dark black line in this particular type of Schlieren image. Behind that primary shock, there are secondary shocks and gaseous products, and that's what you see in the pictures and videos which I show in this particular class. Nonetheless, you can see at a high radius, eventually the blast wave becomes rather like almost a straight line, and for just a general approximation, we can say it's a straight line, and it has a constant change in R over T, which helps justify our assumptions we made on slide deck page 547 of this particular slide deck. So let's make some more, more like uh, observations. This image was actually derived by Pedin and Air, a single gram, and high speed digital camera recorded it. These explosions, as you see, are extremely complex and they involve multiple shock waves, expansion waves, and other flow effects, and turbulence, and of course, all the chemistry and chemical reactions of the products of the highly energetic combustion exothermic reaction. You can see that that primary shock does indeed slow down with increasing radius, and it might be viewed as a constant speed shock at high radius. Here in figure 166 is Gary Suttle's diagram of his particular experiment. Now, let's try and fill in some particular data from the high-speed camera, or the world's first atomic blast. 
The first atomic blast occurred in El Magardo, New Mexico, on July 16, 1945. And from this particular plot and others, we see at a small time the shock wave was a radius of about 210 meters from the ground, from pictures of the blast. Now we can use our very same air blast similarity theory and moving shock calculations to describe the following properties and estimate them just from a camera photo of the first atomic blast, which was classified but released to the public. The velocity of the shock we estimate is 840 meters per second, so a little less than a kilometer per second. Therefore, we can estimate the Mach number of the shock as 840 meters per second divided by the ambient speed of sound. So the Mach Mach number of the incident shock wave from the blast wave is about 2.5. We can then go to the shock tables and we find at gamma 1.4 for air a pressure rise of 7.13 or 7 atmospheres approximately rise across the shock. We can then find the static temperature and density rise across the shock which are 650 Kelvin and 3.33 respectively. We can then find the induced velocity after the shock as 588 meters per second from our moving shockwave theory. We can then look at and find the Mach number after the shockwave, which would be, of course, the induced velocity after shock, the blast, divided by the square root of gamma r times the temperature after the blast wave, which is 650 Kelvin. So indeed, this first atomic blast ever created in the world at the Manhattan Project indeed created a supersonic induced Mach number after the blast wave of 1.15 after a distance of only 210 meters. It's very destructive. So you can see a fixed observer would feel an induced Mach number after the shock wave of course of 210, excuse me, Mach number 1.15 and induced velocity of almost 600 meters per second. It's very destructive. So here's a graph of the world's first atomic blast explosion plotted from a high-speed camera. The x-axis is the position of the blast wave in meters from 0 to 200, and the y-axis plotted down is time from 0 to 0.1 seconds. And if we put in the data points as little pluses and connect them with a line, we can see indeed the line traced out from just a camera of this particular blast wave taken a large distance goes as r to the t to the two-fifth power. We found this experimentally from the nuclear explosion and through blast wave theory in our analysis. Notice we have r and t to the two-fifth power. Indeed, it appears in the atomic explosion graph. t to the two-fifths goes as r. It was found from Buckingham Pi theory without knowing any of the physics. And indeed, it was found in a very, very, very tiny one gram of pet and explosion. So you can see the similarity theory gives you exactly the same types of curves, t to the two-fifths, between a nuclear explosion and a tiny, tiny little explosion done in the lab. This is the power of similarity theory. Now this similarity theory was known in the Soviet Union and of course the United Kingdom during World War II when the Manhattan Project was going on in a very, very top secret project. This was all done in the United Kingdom and examined by G.I. Taylor, who is really one of the fathers, three fathers of this theory, besides of course the gentleman in the Soviet Union and the gentleman in the United States. Here's one particular picture of G.I. Taylor, which is a drawing. He's a famous person in the fluid dynamics community, traditionally, and you'll come across his name Taylor in many parts of turbulence and fluid dynamics. Let's plot the particular um, uh, blast wave a different way. On the x-axis, we'll have the base 10 log of time, and on the y-axis, we'll have 5 halves times the base 10 power log uh, excuse me, base 10 log of r, the distance traveled. If we plot, of course, the graph this way, we'll get a curve. What is the slope of the curve? I'm sure it's related to, of course, the power of time, right? Think about that for a second. So here's a comparison of the original nuclear explosion of blast wave r versus time with G.I. Taylor's similarity theory. So in this case, the similarity theory derived from Buckingham Pi theorem is drawn as the solid line. The measurements from the high-speed camera at the Los Alamos, excuse me, at the um, New Mexico location, the Manhattan Project, is plotted as the pluses. You can see the agreement is amazing. 
And most theoreticians would beg and trade a lot of things to have this kind of prediction, especially because it's a blind prediction. Nonetheless, this allowed for the Soviet Union and the United States to estimate the energy yield of our nuclear weapons simply by videos of the blast wave, which were released to the public. In fact, he wrote his analysis in a particular article. Let's look at the blast wave theory in application. Now, the blast wave theory is a similarity theory that predicts the density of, of course, the hot fireball, which is created by the explosion, which would be very small and almost zero. The fireball is buoyant and rises through the atmosphere, which is another type of compressible flow problem. And you can see these everywhere. Perhaps you have a bonfire outside at a um, you know barbecue or something in the summer or winter in Florida. And you can see above, you can look at the smoke, which has a different density that it entrains the surrounding air if you look at the side of it. This is why you see indeed mushroom type clouds and these so-called toroidal vortices which are like a ring forming around the center of the fire if you have like an outdoor fire pit. It's rather interesting and of course it induces a circulation. That's the same type of thing perhaps from a fire outside on the beach all the way up through a large nuclear explosion or even a volcano erupting you might see these types of toroidal, tor not tornado, toroidal vortices forming. So here's another similarity uh, picture. This one's from the movie The Day After. On the right, you have one particular dye injection in a tank at Caltech. And on the left, you have a particular laser deposited to high energy on the surface of water. You can see that there's large amounts of similarity between the very, very small flow and the very large flow. So for very early movies for special effects, they were actually using these types of flows to try and mimic what a nuclear explosion would look like. And that's all based because they have the same fluid dynamics and general physical similarity between a tiny scale and a large scale. Of course, the tinier scales have lower Reynolds numbers because the scale is smaller, and therefore it's impossible to match exactly the Reynolds number effects between the same fluids at small scale and large scale. And so we wouldn't expect to see as rich uh, developed turbulent cascade in the flow. Let's look at the Manhattan Project for fun and look at one particular building built to study how blast waves affect houses. This is the original house before the blast wave met the house. This is the initial nuclear explosion, and upon detonation, intense optical radiation will essentially burn the front of the house and light it on fire. Then, of course, the shock wave arises, and it induces a velocity u sub g, which might be a supersonic Mach number, behind the shock, and it'll literally, of course, blow the house down, much like the big bad wolf would in a stick house from the famous nursery rhyme. About a second later, of course, UG will reverse and the air will rush back towards ground zero. And we can talk more about that in the class of the reason for this. Nonetheless, you can imagine that blast wave similarity theory was amazing at the time because it allowed for foreign adversaries of the United States to estimate yields of nuclear explosions just by looking at the blast wave as they were of the similarity theory developed in the three countries independently. Let's now change our subject to the idea of convergent divergent nozzles. In this particular case, we want to see what happens when a normal shock wave appears inside the nozzle. Here's one particular Schlieren image. The flow moves from left to right, and it is a choked de Laval nozzle. Here you see the flow is moving supersonically, and you see it's almost like a fine checkered board pattern. We'll talk about that pattern later in the class and the properties of the flow there soon. But for whatever reason, the back pressure is not low enough to completely allow the flow to be supersonic through the whole nozzle. To match the back pressure in this case, there must be a shock wave within the nozzle to balance out the back pressure and therefore have a subsonic flow in the nozzle. This strong dark line, which is vertical, and light line, denoted by the Schlern image, which are density gradients in the flow, denotes a normal shock wave at this location. You'll note that near the walls, on the top and bottom, that the flow is actually separated off the wall, and it causes turbulent flow. There's also a lot of turbulent flow through the whole nozzle at this point. And there's a bouncing uh, shock waves moving up and down in the flow. Nonetheless, this part of the shock where my cursor is moving is indeed a normal shock. And we could treat the flow in front of it as isentropic, then pass through a standing normal shock on the nozzle, and treat the flow as isentropic after. But we cannot use one-dimensional flow theory for this problem, because of course the cross-sectional area is changing with increasing streamwise direction, and we'll have to handle that. 
At this point in the class, I normally show a video from the American Physical Society Division of Fluid Dynamics, which is submitted by none other than Professor Lelly of Stanford. And this will show particular shockwaves in the tunnels. I'll try and show this privately in class. Uh, since the video is, of course, its property, I'm using it privately for educational purposes, which falls under the fair use doctrine. Let's now analyze the particular problem of the standing normal shock wave and convergent divergent nozzles, or the Duval nozzle. In this case, the flow is not isentropic through the whole nozzle. In fact, in figure 179, you might treat the flow as totally isentropic from the nozzle plenum through the face of the nozzle uh, normal shock at state 1, and from state 2 after the shock it might be isentropic through the whole exit. Now if a standing normal shock exists in the nozzle, the nozzle exit Mach number must always be subsonic if the nozzle is continuing to, of course, diverge because you're slowing down the flow. If these concepts are unfamiliar to you, I suggest you go back into this class and review. Now we'll let this particular nozzle, in this example, have an area of the exit, which is known as sub E, divided by the area of the throat, a sub t, or a, a sub star, of 3. This means that the nozzle area ratio is 3. Nozzle area ratio means the exit area of the nozzle divided by the throat. In this nozzle, you know that the flow must be choked and transonic at the throat. Otherwise, it would be subsonic through the whole nozzle. So that's su subsonic flow in the, di in the convergent section, supersonic flow in the first part of the di con divergent section, and subsonic flow after the shock wave in the last part of the divergent section. Boy, is that complicated. So we'll just say, for analysis purposes, that some shock wave for now rests at a location a over a sub t equals 2. So you see the area ratio a over a sub t equals 2, and that might be the area at the cross section where the normal shock is. So for example, in this simulation, this might be a over a sub t of 2, and the exit might be, say, area 3 over a sub, area exit over area of the throat of 3. Now for this particular problem, we indeed seek to find the ratio of the exit to reservoir pressure ratio, which drives the flow in the nozzle. And you know, of course, that it has to be greater than the critical pressure ratio to get a supersonic flow in the nozzle. Let's do this through a particular example. Say the Mach number at station 1 from our isentropic tables, A1 over A1 sup star is 2. So we would look up A1 over A sup star of 2 before the normal shock. We would then find a Mach number M1 of 2.2. That indeed is the Mach number at state 1, the Mach number in front of the normal shock. Then from the normal shock tables or equations, at M1 2.2, we would find M2 of 0 0.5471 for gamma 1.4. That is M2, that's the Mach number after the normal shock. And then we can also find a corresponding total pressure loss across the shock of 0 0.6281, which of course should be less than one. That means the total pressure ratio after the normal shock and before is 0 0.6281. Now at station 2, right after the normal shock, we have a Mach number 0 0.5471. This means that indeed we have a new choking area ratio of A sub 2 over A sub star 1.27. You can see that has gone down from the original A1 over A sub star ratio. And so if we wanted to rechoke the flow, if we had sufficient thermodynamic quantities, we would have to go down to a new area ratio of A sub star 1.27. You can see, indeed, A sub star has changed across the normal shock wave as expected. Why? Because, of course, there's an entropy crease across the normal shock wave, which we've shown and proved in our previous classes on normal shock wave theory. Now, what if we want to find the particular exit area to the second choked area? We might find, then, AE over A2 times A2 over A2 sup star. See, A2 crosses out in the second term. And write out AE over AT, AT over A2, A2 over A2 sup star. So you can see ATs and A2s are crossing out. So I've simply multiplied, multiplied my original term, which I simply wrote, because that's what I'm interested in finding, as A2 over A2 times T2, A2 over AT. This will go as because I know AE over AT, that's the area ratio of the nozzle, 
times the area of the throat divided by A2, and A2 divided by A2 sup star. I know the second and third terms, and I can fill them in now. I'll have 3 times a half times 1.27, and indeed I'll find 1.905. That's the area of the eggs in the nozzle divided by the so-called imaginary choked area in the second state of the flow in the divergent part of the nozzle. You'll note that the flow is subsonic behind the nozzle and sh behind the shock wave. So therefore the remaining portion of the nozzle is divergent and must be subsonic and deaccelerate the flow. We can then indeed look up on our isentropic flow tables the AE over A2 soup star and we'll find 1.905 which will give us an exit Mach number 0.32 and a total pressure to the static pressure ratio of 1.074. So you'll note that the total pressure in one is PO1, and the total pressure at the exit is of course POE or PO2, just the way we write them. But we already find the total pressure ratio across the nozzle. I seek in this problem to try and find the static pressure at the exit divided by the total pressure ratio. This is the inverse of the nozzle pressure ratio, which is the stat total pressure in the nozzle plenum divided by the ambient or exit pressure for a subsonic nozzle. I can expand out my terms just like I did in equation 453 into terms that I know. For example, I know PE over POE. I know POE over PO2 which is one. I know PO2 over PO1, which is the, of course the stagnation pressure loss across the shock. And I also know PO1 over P0, which is also one, because it's isentropic flow before the shock. Let's fill in those numbers. I now have 1.1 divided by 1.074, one, 0 0.6281, and one. Putting those numbers and evaluating it for you, I get 0 0.585, which is of course the inverse of the nozzle pressure ratio. What is the nozzle pressure ratio? It would be, of course, 1 over 0 0.585. Try out this problem numerically for yourself. Now, that's usually the process of solving the problem when we know the location of the normal shock. However, in practice, we never know the location in advance. We only know the operating conditions of the nozzle, which are the nozzle pressure ratio, P0 over P infinity, and the total temperature ratio, which is T0 over T infinity. P0 and T0 are the values in the nozzle plenum in figure 180. And P infinity and T infinity are, of course, the ambient values outside of the particular nozzle. This approach, of course, to find the location of the normal shock inside the divergent section of the nozzle will, of course, require an iterative approach, which is very difficult. Or you can do a more direct approach. We'll talk about both very briefly. The iterative approach will be a guess and check method, if you will. We call these shooting methods. And in fact, they're called shooting methods because you might take a shot and see that you're wrong and adjust your shot and take it again until your residual error is increased or decreased, excuse me, and you approach the and converge towards the solution. So this iterative approach will alter the shock location through initial guesses and correct the values of, of course, P sub E over P naught to be found through, of course, our previous approach, which we just discussed. And so we would guess a particular shock position and go through the numerical algorithm, which I showed through an example to, to confirm the ratio P over P naught. That's fine to do it that way. Now, let's define nozzle pressure ratio formula, NPR, nozzle pressure ratio. It goes as P0 over P infinity, which might be, for the subsonic nozzle case, approximately, but not equal to, P0 over PE. So that's an approximation assumption. In fact, at the nozzle exit itself, PE, especially for compressible flows, is absolutely not equal to the atmospheric pressure. In fact, it might be a little bit lower or higher, depending on the nozzle flow. And if it's off design or over expand or unexpanded, which we'll talk about later in this class, just know that this is not absolutely true. Nonetheless, you take the pressure in the plenum, the total pressure divided by the ambient, and you have your operating conditions of the nozzle. Now we might conclude the following for these particular cases for the normal shock case. The total pressure in front of the normal shock is always equal to the total pressure in the plenum because it's isentropic flow through the whole nozzle interior on the center line. You can also conclude that indeed that A1 soup star is equal to the area of the throat. But indeed we do not know what A2 soup star is because it depends on the position of the shock in the nozzle, which we don't know in advance. Now recall that we previously derived the mass flow rate 
through our semi-one-dimensional isentropic theory for a choked nozzle, that is a nozzle where the flow is transonic at the minimum area, A sub 1 sub star. Here I represent the equation again in 460, so you can recall it of the slide deck. M dot is the mass flow rate through the nozzle at any cross-sectional area, according to our assumptions of the theory. So it says P naught A sub star T to the half naught times the square root of gamma over R, 2 over gamma plus 1 to the gamma plus 1 over gamma minus 1. Look at this equation carefully. Everything under the square root is a constant. We know gamma, we know the gas constant R. We know stagnation temperature, which is constant, because that stagnation temperature is located in the nozzle plenum, and it's constant throughout the isentropic part of the flow. We know A sub star, that's the area of the throat of the nozzle, that's just geometry, and we know total pressure from, of course, the stagnation condition in the nozzle. So, therefore, the mass flow rate is really constant through the whole nozzle, even though M, we cross a shock. So M dead, of course, is constant through the whole nozzle, unless we have mass injection or something in the nozzle, or injection of some fuel or some other exotic thing, like an afterburner. Nonetheless, we will now recall how we found the equation for M dot to a proceed. Remember, M dot, in this particular analysis, in steady flow, which is quasi one dimensional, will be the local density times the local area times the local velocity. We can substitute this in with A sub star's area of the throat, P naught and T naught with reservoir pressures and temperatures using ideal gas law if we require. And we'll find in 461 relative to 460 that M dot, the mass flow rate, will go as the total pressure times the choked area, the transonic area at the nozzle throat, divided by T naught to the half, times that function of gamma and R, which is the square root of 460, will go as P naught times A sub star over T naught to the half. Now remember, T naught and M dot are constant across the shock because it's standing. Remember, a standing normal shock wave conserves total temperature across it. And this is a, something we're very thankful so we can do this analysis. It would be much more complicated if this was not the case. Therefore, since T naught and M dot are constant, we can also say and imply from equation 461 that P naught and A sub star must also be constant. And this gives us a very powerful tool to cross standing normal shocks in the convergent diversion nozzle problem where a standing normal shock of course is in the divergent part of the nozzle. You can see now that I can write because of this analysis that PO1 times A1 sub star goes as and is equal to PO2 times A2 sub star. This is absolutely wonderful. I can rewrite the right hand side as exit quantities because of course the total pressure is constant in isentropic flow from after the shock to the nozzle exit. And A2 sup star is exactly the same as its isentropic flow at the exit of the nozzle and of course right after the shock wave. So we can write PO1 times A1 sup star is POE times AE sup star. You'll see that because of the isentropic flow through the nozzle um, before and after the shock, and it's not across the shock wave, but this beautiful relation holds and it allows us to try and solve the problem in a more direct way using our physics and of course our mathematical knowledge. Let's try and, try and rearrange the particular equation which I just showed and rewrite it as PE over AE, that's the static pressure at the nozzle exit times the area of the nozzle exit, divided by POE times AE sup star, which is the right hand side of 463. I can then write the same numerator, but replace the denominator as PO1 with A1 sup star, which of course is the left hand side of 462. We can then change out and write it as two terms, two fractions. The first fraction is PE over PO1, and the second fraction is AE over A1 sup star. You see this one replacement allows me and gives me a very powerful tool to solve the problem. The first fraction is known. If you've been paying very close attention, you'll see that PO1, the stagnation pressure in the plenum, or in front of the normal shock, divided by the ambient pressure, PE, or exit of the pressure, of nozzle static pressure, is the inverse of the nozzle pressure ratio, which we know as the nozzle operating condition, at least one of them. The second term we know from the geometry of the nozzle is the area ratio of the nozzle. It's the exit area of the nozzle divided by the throat area of the nozzle. Now recall our isentropic relations across and after the exit 
of the nozzle to the face of the shock wave in the divergent part of the nozzle. That equation is just isentropic and we wrote it in 465. It's the static pressure at the exit of the nozzle divided by the total pressure at the exit of the nozzle will go as 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 times the Mach number at the exit of the nozzle squared to the negative gamma over gamma minus 1. Also recall the Mach number area relation which we derived earlier. And in this case, it's for choked flow. So the area of the exit divided by the choked area, which is an, a, a physical area in this particular problem, it's the area to reach out the flow after the shock wave, will go as a function of exit Mach number. You might multiply these two equations together. Why would we do that? Well, on the right-hand side of 464, you see I was rather keen to put PE over PO1 and AE over A1 soup star. And that is only these two terms, and of course 465 and 466, are only functions of exit Mach number and gamma. If we multiply these together, the left-hand side of 467 is the same as the right-hand side of 464. Let's multiply those together and simplify, and you'll get 467 the right-hand side is equal to, of course, the right-hand side of 464. It's only a function of exit Mach number and gamma. Gamma is constant due to our earlier assumptions, and we might be able to seek exit Mach number only for a standing normal shock on the flow only as a function of the inverse of the nozzle pressure ratio and of course the in the area ratio of the nozzle. So we can actually solve 467 for 468 for ME and find a closed form form for the exit Mach number of the nozzle as only a function of gamma and 2 and 1 times these known values. So look at the known values. We know the static exit pressure. We know the nozzle plenum pressure. That is, in fact, the inverse of nozzle pressure ratio times AE, the area exit nozzle, divided by the throat area. That's the area ratio of the nozzle. So the inverse nozzle pressure ratio times the area ratio of the nozzle will give us this factor. We square it, we half it, we multiply it by these prefactors and add negative 1 over gamma minus 1, and we get the exit Mach number squared. So you can see we found a direct closed form formula for the exit Mach number given a particular situation, which is independent, of course, of the actual shockwave location, which we don't have to know in the particular case. So this represents the exit Mach number for a standing shock within the divergent section. Remember, M sub E must be a subsonic value because we have a normal shockwave, and it must enforce this through multi-valued solution. Since we have a square root in 468, you can see we actually have two solutions and we would choose the subsonic real value. So indeed, we can find a particular ME and then find POE over PE from an isentropic relation if, for instance, we knew ME and the area ratio. So it's simple through this approach to find the particular location of the shock wave itself at some position A which is a function of x inside the divergent part of the nozzle. So this is a very simple approach now that we've done the hard work and analysis which I just showed. Here's the approach. First, find the total pressure ratio across the shock from our basic shock relation. We might write PO2 over P1. This is the total pressure loss across the shock. And we can write that as the total pressure at the exit of the nozzle divided by the total pressure in the plenum because PO2 equals PoE. We can then multiply through by PE over PE and write PoE divided by PE, which is the total pressure at the exit divided by the ambient pressure or static pressure at the exit. And then we have PE over PO1, which is the inverse of the nozzle pressure ratio, right? The total pressure on the plenum divided by the exit or ambient pressure. Now, from PO2 over PO1, which we can solve for is we know these particular values, from the exit Mach number, of course, we can find PoE over PE from the isentropic relation from ME from 468. We can then find M1, which is the Mach number in front of the shock wave inside the nozzle. So we would take PO2 over PO1, which is the pressure loss across the shock, and find M1. M1, of course, is a function of PO2 over PO1, and of course that's in equations and tables which we found earlier. 
What do we do now? Well, we want to seek A1 over A1 sup star. A1, of course, is the area at the shock, and A1 sup star is the choked area at the throat of the nozzle. We already have M1 from our tables. M1 is the Mach number in front of the shock, and M1 is also the Mach number at area A1. Therefore, we can go in our isentropic tables, look up M1, which should be a supersonic value, not subsonic, because it's in front of the shock, and then find A1 over A1 sup star. Since we know the geometry of the nozzle, A is a function of x only, we can then find the axial position of the shock relative to the coordinates reference frame of the nozzle defined by the nozzle contour. It's rather straightforward. Let's do this in a very, very simple example now. It reads, for a convergent divergent nozzle, CD nozzle, find the shock location. Given the area of the exit divided by the area of throat, we'll say it's three, that's the area ratio of the nozzle is three. The total pressure inside the nozzle is a single atmosphere, and the atmospheric or exit pressure is a half atmosphere. Therefore, the nozzle pressure ratio is two. NPR equals two, area ratio is three. Find the shock location for this particular nozzle. Here's the solution. We'll use our developed equations and plug and chug, so to speak. The static pressure at the exit divided by the total pressure in the plenum is the nozzle pressure ratio, which is the inverse, which would be, of course, two, or one half in the case, because we're doing the inverse, times the area ratio of the nozzle, 0.5 over one, times three is 1.5. Now 1.5 will be equated through PE over AE over POE over AE sup star, found from the previous equation in 468. We can then evaluate me squared and take the square root. And you'll see after doing the hard work and putting it in, we'll find an exit Mach number of 0.38. You have to be very careful before you do this and check your pressure ratios and area ratio of the nozzle. It could be that the shock has actually pushed up the nozzle and your pressure ratio is high enough for a shock not to exist. You also should check if your pressure ratio is above 1.89 or of course your nozzle will never even choke. Now we can look up in our isentropic tables that exit Mach number 0.38. You will find, through equations of the tables, a total pressure at the exit divided by the ambient pressure of the exit of 1.094. Also, from this, you can now do an expansion and write PO2 over PO1, as we need to find the total pressure loss across the normal shock as PO, POE, the total pressure at the exit, divided by the total pressure in front of the shock, times PE over PE. We know these two fractions individually. We just found the first one, 1.094. The second one, of course, is once again our friendly nozzle pressure ratio, the stagnation pressure in the plenum divided by the ambient, which will be, of course, 0.5 divided by 1, inverted. So we'll have 1.094 times 0.5 over 1 is 0.547. Work through these problems on your own. Now, Looking up this total pressure ratio for a particular shock, we'll have a Mach number M1 of 2.38. That's the Mach number in front of the shock, which is indeed supersonic, which is good. Now, from our isentropic relations for supersonic Mach number 2.38, you'll find a particular area ratio, A over A sup star, to choke the flow, or A over the A throat is 2.36. This is indeed the area at A1, which is the shock location divided by the area of the throat, 2.36. You'll notice the area ratio of the nozzle is three. If you find a solution which is greater than three, you've obviously made a mistake, so be careful. You can't have an area ratio of the shock which is larger, larger than the nozzle exit. That would be really weird, unless you had a very strange and inefficient nozzle. Um, it is possible, to, of course, to have a solution like that physically, but it's not a practical nozzle solution. In this class, we looked and reviewed and introduced air blast similarity theory and put it in the historical context of the early Manhattan Project and the release of the atomic energy blast uh, in terms of um, uh, the similarity variable eta. We then looked at and introduced the normal shock waves within a convergent divergent nozzle. Indeed, we've seen two approaches to solving the problem. The iterative approach, where we guess and check our solution, the shooting method, or the more direct approach. It's up to you which method you prefer and want to use. One is obviously a little bit more work, which is why we use computers for iterative methods. Or one is more elegant and has some inherent mathematical beauty because it's a direct closed form analytical solution 
to find the shock wave location in the nozzle given an area ratio and the operating conditions of the nozzle, the nozzle pressure ratio only and not total temperature ratio in this case. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.